Hoi, mahalo nui lo, and thank you for joining us this week in yet another exciting and informative episode of Vala Ao. I'm Dicky Chang. Approximately the calendar year 1953, there was a young lady that was a co-star of the Broadway musical South Pacific. That was known, and she was known, none other than, than the lovely Mitzi Gaynor. Well, guess what? Here came South Pacific. There's a blockbuster movie, Broadway, internationally famous. Well, in the calendar year 2009, specifically October 3rd, after 50 years, she came back to the island of Kauai to help us celebrate the 50th anniversary of statehood. We caught up with her at then the former opening of the number 18th St. Regis Resort in the world. That, of course, was the St. Regis up in Princeville. Let's recap one and reminisce the Vala'o time capsule of our interview with, of course, the lovely Mitzi Gaynor. Prior to this evening's event, we had an opportunity to catch up with the lovely, radiantly talented and effervescent Mitzi Gaynor, and this is what she had to say, reminiscing her stay 50 years ago here on the Garden Island of Kauai. It's amazingly, startlingly beautiful, gorgeous. It's, uh, it's Bally High, isn't it? <gasps> Golly, when I think of the first time we came here 50 years, <clears throat> 50 years ago, it was a green meadow and a hole and the plane landed there and now I think when we got off at the airport it was like being in Orly in Paris I mean 15 or how many how many gates did they have it's me and you have a great deal to do with this don't you you're one of the people that has made this island so exceptional I mean look at the beauty of this place look at the the ambiance the truth and the warmth I feel I'm rejuvenated really no I just lost 10 years the minute I got off the plane Mitzi tell us um you know, when you were first contacted to do South Pacific, did you know about Hawaii or did you review the script or how was that decision made that you wanted to come on to Kauai to film South Pacific? Well, Kauai was a kind of an unknown entity at that particular time because um, I don't think the tour, you know, we're, again, we're talking 50 years ago, Bebe, and uh, uh, you, you didn't have that many tourists and there were no, I, you know, I stayed at the Coco Palms Hotel, which was a fabulous place because do you remember, do you, you, I don't think you remember the, of course you do, you do, but they were the, like the, the little cottages with the tin roofs and, and the coconuts would fall and bang on the roof and wake you up in the middle of the night. It, uh, uh, it was, um, I had nothing to do with choosing this island, but the powers that be at 20th Century Fox, uh, Daryl Zanuck and his whole unit and Josh Logan and Rogers and Hammerstein and everyone concerned with it decided on this place because it was paradise. So as you were filming the movie and the movie became a hit, obviously, did you know what the impact was going to be or did you even fathom what the success would have been like? Well, I thought because the play was so successful, you know, and uh, because the book was such a big success. And because so many people could um, relate to the fact that it was the Second World War and it would stay in, in part of somebody's life forever and ever and ever. Yeah, I, I had a pretty, but I didn't know it would last this long. I mean, it's kind of like share, if you know what I mean. It, um, it retires every so often, but it comes back for one more time. And so uh, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's what we're doing. We're bringing it back. And now, of course, you know it's in, 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 um, in Blu-ray, and so it's, uh, and the sales are amazing because the people want to see it. It's, of course, you can never quite replicate the actual beauty of the island of Kauai. You can't because there are so many spirits. It's so spiritual. But the color, I think you can feel it when you see it. So as you were, you know, notified by your people, like, hey, uh -huh. would you like to come to Kauai and celebrate the 50th anniversary of statehood and, yes. of course, the filming of South Pacific. Yes. What was going through your mind at that particular time? I was thrilled. I, th I was absolutely thrilled, and I haven't been here for 50 years. You know, Jack and I, my, my dear husband, and I, um, had f we've made friends. We're going to see some of them tonight, as a matter of fact, at the gala, or gala, whichever you want to say. And uh, they're the Fujis, and they're wonderful, wonderful friends. And, and uh, I'm going to see David Penhollow, who is an a tr island treasure, as you know. And uh, we've always kept in touch. And um, I, was, I thought it would be one of, now is the time to do it. And um, the opening of the hotel, and the f I forgot, you know, I'm so busy. It's all about me, you know, darling. I, I forgot that it was also a celebration of the statehood. So, um, yes, I should be here. God wants me to be here, or all the gods want me to be here, and that's why I'm here. So as your career uh, progressed, you know, like, uh, say, for example, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. 40 years ago, mm -hmm. w was it ever in the back of your mind thinking to yourself, oh, my goodness, the 50th anniversary of South Pacific is right around the corner? No. Um, it just it it just came. I mean, all of a sudden, I thought, 
50 years. My God, it can't be 50 years. Look in the mirror. <laughs> you know all about that. You've been around for a couple of weeks too, haven't you? Uh, it's, um, it's very exciting. It's thrilling. And I'm so glad that I'm still part of it. And I'm so glad that you wanted me to come. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, I beg your pardon. But interestingly, you know, the, the residents of the island of Kauai, the state of Hawaii, and, you know, really our visitor base that's here, when they found out that you're going to be on the island, uh, there's a lot of buzz. There's a, you got a lot of fans out there. Isn't it wonderful? It's so thrilling. It really, really is. Um, I treasure it. Um, you know, I come from an area, Beverly Hills, you know, California, um, Los Angeles, the movie business, you know, it's um, insular, you know, it's, um, there's so much take, take, take there, very little giving, and there's so much giving here, and people are so, I mean, I, I was talking to somebody a little while ago on the other side of the room, and a lady came up and she said, I've always wanted to meet you. And I said, well, I'm, I'm talking to somebody right now, can I? So she had some of her girlfriends, and we had a sip of tea together. It's, 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 it's um, life-changing. This place is life-changing. You know, Mitzi Ginner, you talked earlier about the spirits, and you talked a little bit about the mana. You know, when you are able to put your feet in the water and rub your toes in the sand and yes. walk around and mm -hmm. look at the waterfalls and mm -hmm. look at what you remember, can you explain to the viewing audience what that feeling may possibly be like? Well, I'm a city girl, so this is... Uh, it's nature, isn't it? I have to tell you that when we arrived here 50 years ago, getting off the plane, uh, we were all girdled and stockinged and purses and shoes and hats to match and gloves. And the minute we breathed the air and the trade winds blew across our skin, we said, let me out of these clothes. And we went and bought mumus and we went native. It was wonderful. And it's, you know, I still have some things that I got here before. I really do. They're put away, but they're still treasures. Well, I'm sure you're going to have a great time with the Fuji e Ohana oh, and with yes, David Penahalo and everybody else. We're going to have fun tonight. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful night. I wish everybody watching you could come and could come and be with us. But you're going to be with us anyway, aren't you, tonight? Absolutely. How could we do it without you? I just want to take this opportunity to share our aloha on behalf of the residents of the island of Kauai and certainly the statehood and all your fans. Why don't you take this opportunity to share your aloha out to the people of Kauai and Niihau? Aloha and mahalo. Oh, we're going to a hukilau. I can't wait for that to happen tonight. See you later. Thank you, darling. Aloha Kauai, we're back. And with me is our executive director for our Kauai Visitors Bureau, Sue Konoho. What a very, very incredible week for all of Kauai. Well, this is the highlight of my career. I'm just thrilled about this event, about the opening of the St. Regis, but also to have Mitzi Gaynor back on Kauai 50 years later from when she filmed the movie. Now, first and foremost, what does it mean for Hawaii and Kauai to get a St. Regis brand name here? On Kauai. Well, it's a gorgeous property, and of course, the service that comes with the St. Regis name is incredible. So, I think it will really um, help Kauai in its brand of there's diversity on Kauai, but then this has some five star excellence. It's going to be awesome for the North Shore. You know, Sukanoho, months and months and months ago, you came up with a concept, you came up with a thought. Why don't we try to see if we can get Mitzi Gaynor? to come to the island of Kauai. Tell us about that process. Well, it was part of the economic stimulus money that we came up with the idea, hoping that she would say yes. And when she did, we were able to deliver with the support of those funds. Um, that's above and beyond what we normally get. So it was a great opportunity for us. And then just to have her come back 50 years later is a lot of media, a lot of attention. And I think it's kind of, for us, full circle, especially for the 50th anniversary of South Pacific. So it, it's an honor, and it's just been thrilling to see her and have her connect with some old friends, too. You know, having to have to do literally the groundwork from the bottom, when you finally were able to have your people get a hold of their people and her people get in a hold of her, mm -hmm. and when she said yes, did you, like, like freak out? <laughs> um, there were lots of screams of joy, um, so I was thrilled. And I have to acknowledge um, Patrick Dugan and the McNeil Wilson team have been by my side through and through for this because I couldn't have done it by myself. And of course, my team at the Kauai Visitors Bureau has also been great. And we're also trying to do a little bit of a benefit back to the Kauai Museum as a gift back to Kauai Museum. Um, so we'll see when it's all said and done if we can give a donation back to the Kauai Museum. Now, describe to the viewing audience, you know, truly, what is Mitzi Gaynor really like? So wonderful. I was so pleasantly surprised, but just from the heart 
and full of aloha and just looks spectacular. I mean, I hope I'm that lucky someday. And uh, just really sharing herself, but then asking about other people too. She wants to know about you and she cares and she's trying to do, I think, just that real reconnection back to the island. She knows David Penhalo very well and Jocelyn Fuji extremely well also. So we're gonna have them all involved in this as well. You know, when, when the net net of everything is all said and done, how huge of a boost will be this as far as awareness for the island of Kauai? Well, from a media standpoint alone, uh, the first press release that we even issued was the best press release we've ever done in the 12 years I've been at the Bureau. So 190 hits off of one press release is very, very big. So that's very, I think for us, very successful just in that alone, and then all that's come with it as well. So I think one, we heard people were coming just to see her, flying in just to see her, and then two, the economic uh, stimulus of the public relations. You, you really can't put a dollar figure on that. You know, and you can't really put a dollar figure on the fact that the St. Regis, the only St. Regis in the state of Hawaii is right here again at this grand opening at Princeville. And we also got Mitzi Gaynor to boot with the uh, South Pacific fame. I mean, this is going to be, uh, you know, a, um, a start, if you will, by planting great, great, great seeds about the future of uh, Kauai and as far as tourism is concerned? Well, we actually um, held this evening for the St. Regis. So we could have done this event earlier, but quite frankly, I wanted to hold it for the St. Regis because I thought it was a win-win for us and for them. And it was kind of the culmination of our year of celebration for the uh, 50th anniversary of South Pacific. So when uh, we ran into some challenges on dates, we said, you know what, we're gonna hold for them. It's important and we want it to work. So it's been a very good partnership with the St. Regis property. You know, and I just wanna say, as far as I know, it truly is working because a lot of local residents and a lot of visitors that just happen to be on the island knowing that Mitzi Gaynor is going to be on the island, they all want to meet her, they all want to see her, and they all want to reminisce. And what better person, I think, to reminisce with is with herself personally because she is gung-ho and uh, full of a law. Well, I've been really blessed that she's been able to extend herself so much. I mean, honestly, I was afraid it was just going to be one or two things, but she has given and given and given different interviews and spoken with people. We had a press trip last night, so she spoke with those press writers. So it's just been, I mean, it's like having family back. I mean, I don't know her that well, but I feel really connected to her, and she's been very good about um, trying to share herself with as many people as she can within reason. Um, I said uh, tomorrow at the at the other property that we're having an event at, I said just, just make sure we have a couple security guys just in case, because we've actually had a couple phone calls of people who are, wanted to whisk her away to their house, you know, to have dinner. So. <laughs> We won't be able to go that far, but I think tomorrow with the afternoon with Mitzi Gaynor will be uh, really a great opportunity for Kauai people to see her firsthand and hear her stories. What a wonderful opportunity to reminisce that wonderful interview. That was one of the best interviews, and that was during the time, remember 2009, when we're still going through the economic recession. And back then, it was, if it's flat, it's where it's at. If it's flat, it's where it's at. Thank you very much to Sukanoho and our good friends at McNeil Wilson. It was a great time reminiscing Mitzi Gaynor. And of course, if she was here today, I hope she's well, she would have been 89 years young. We're gonna have to take a short break, but don't go away, gang. Vala'au, we'll be right back. And when we come back, we'll be recapping last year's season of our native birds in our Garden Island, Koi. It is that time that they return, of course, those, of course, the Neil Shearwaters. Don't go away, gang. Tracy Anderson and I will be right back. Aloha, my name is Joyce Medina and I'm the chair of the Events and Activities Committee for the Kauai Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to 2019. We have a full year ready for you. We have our task at, on that committee is to fill our chamber calendar. We are committed to presenting 10 business after hours, four quarterly dinners, um, several lunches here and there, and seminars. We are fortunate that this year our calendar is almost full with two more slots at the end of the year. We welcome you to join us at our business after hours or our quarterly dinners. And once again, my name is Joyce Bedina from the Events and Activities Committee with the Kauai Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Feel the beauty of this sign up Down from the beaches to the highest mountain Different people Living as one in harmony under the sun on the island in the middle of the sea on the Pool Kea Golf Course. Call for your tea times today. 
Welcome back Hawaii. During the season of September 15th to December 15th, of course, this is a season known as the fledging of the Newell Shearwaters. What are the Newell Shearwaters? What was the last season like as far as the Newell Shearwater count was concerned? Well, let's go and talk to our very dear friend with our SOS Save Our Shearwaters specialist, Tracy Anderson. Uh, the, the season went fairly uneventfully. It was, uh, we had a really good team and we got uh, of the of the birds that we got live of the new Wilshire waters we got live uh, there was a 90 per, 91% release rate so that was really good we got most of them out the door in good condition um, about just about less than half uh, we did what was called direct release. We did look them over in the field. Uh, the technicians know how to uh, examine them, make sure there's no injuries, uh, their feathers are uncontaminated. Uh, they take a few measurements, put a band on, and then they release them. Um, just over half of them came, had to come back to the Humane Society in our little area here for a further further examination, make sure there's no injuries, no contamination, uh, that sort of thing. Um, most of them only spend a few days in care. Uh, we had 20, just over 20 birds that spent more than seven days in care here uh, before they were released again. Uh, yeah, that's... Would you say it's an unvent, uh, uneventful season? We want to let the viewing audience know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the season technically is from September 15th to December 15th. Yes, that's correct. So the fledging seasons, when the the young uh, uh, Newell Shear waters, when they're ready to fledge from their mountain burrows, and um, they do it at night, and they do it with no parental care. So basically, the parents have been coming back and forth from the ocean at night throughout the whole breeding season, feeding these chicks. And when the chicks are ready to go, they're all uh, their their feathers are all in. They're at a good weight they um, fledge and they do it by themselves. Like the parents aren't there around at all um, and they take off at night and they head out to sea. And that takes it starts taking place in September and it goes through into October. Um, and then by the end of October, Newells are, fair, are starting to um, you know, finish their fledging. And then we have Hawaiian petrels that also fledge, which is another endangered species here. They start fledging here on Kauai. Um, and also we have the wedge-tailed shearwaters that nest here on Kauai, which nest on the periphery of the island. They start fledging at the, in, into November and then into December. Now, when you say the parents go out at night mm -hmm. uh, and everything is basically done at night, when you say the parents go out to, to get food or what have you, mm -hmm. does mommy stick back and daddy goes out or does daddy stick back and mommy goes out or are both of them out at the same time? Both of them are out at the same time. The chick, after the first week, after the after the the um, incubate during the incubation period, there's always a, a parent with it. So both the male and the female, both the dad and the mom, um, share parental incubation duties. Uh, so one goes out to sea, the other one um, incubates the egg. Once the egg has hatched, um, the one parent, it's called a guard phase, um, will stick around for about a week and stay with the chick to make sure that it's thermoregulating, keeping its temperature um, and all that. And then after that, both parents are out at sea foraging for the chick. So the chick is left alone in it by itself in its burrow. So if one or the other unsuccessfully comes back, heaven forbid, mm -hmm. then it's the task of the other one to double duty in terms of, I would guess, supplying food uh, or making a decision whether they, do they, would they tend to bail the chick and take care of themselves? Well, unfortunately, they will continue to come back and forth. Uh, if one of the parents is lost, the other parent will continue to feed the chick. The problem is, is that it really is a two-parent par duty to get f enough food to feed that chick for a successful fledge. So if if one of the parents is lost late in the season, it's possible that the bird, uh, the chick can leave at a good Good condition but if a parent is lost usually the chick ends up in relatively poor condition and the likelihood of survival is very small and the parents or in this case the mother would only lay one egg yes they only lay one egg per season so there's one egg per pair per season and if that egg is lost at any point um, or the chick lost they do not re-nest in that season they it has to wait they have to wait till the next year to lay another egg so are these birds like some other birds, are they lifers? Like the, they meet, they mate, they pair for life, how's that go? They tend to stay together, yes. They, if when they get that mate that um, they are, 
uh, they've raised chicks successfully with, they tend to stay with the same mate um, throughout their lives. If one of the, the parents is lost, one of the adults is lost, it may take a season or two for the remaining adult to find another mate um, to continue breeding. Um, yeah, that's it's, it's a long process. It's why their population can't grow very quickly um, and it's a really, it's a, it's a big deal if an adult is lost. Now, you know, I've always wondered, and I'm sure a lot of the viewing audience uh, are probably thinking, now when you say that the, the parents will split the baby at night that's fully fledged with the proper weight or the physical abilities will then jump off a cliff or a higher elevated area out to sea, <laughs> then what? Where do they find who they need to find? Or is it's it instinctual. For this species, um, so some bird species have a parental care period when after they fledge, um, like the boobies do, um, some of the other species here, they continue to come back and forth to where they, they nested and the parents will continue to feed them while they learn to hunt. Uh, the shearwaters and petrels, they're, it's purely instinct. When they leave the nest, they're on their own. They have to figure out where to find food, how to find food, all that kind of thing. And it's all, it's all up there. And, and, and Tracy Anderson, remind me of this word that I always mispronounce. Palangic or, the palangic or correct me, but those are the birds that live on the water all their life and they, you know, they, they can't fly from the ground. They need that water to paddle mm -hmm. and they need to glide. Yeah, so um, it, the word is pelagic, uh, which basically means at sea and they are, they do, they spend the majority of their lives on the open ocean. Um, they only come to land to breed. That's the only reason they need to come to land. Um, they, you're right, they have their body, their body morphology has their legs situated farther back on their body. So unlike something like a duck or a goose that can do a direct takeoff from the ground, they need a forward momentum to get air, airborne. Uh, so either jumping off a cliff or a high spot, um, they run across the water to get that lift. Um, or, and, they, and a good oncoming breeze is, as, is helpful as well. And let us know about their, uh, their uh, not paddles or not their fins or not their, well, I guess it's the feet or the web mm -hmm. foot. They have some sort of a grip along with the beak that they can elevate they, themselves? They do. They actually can curl their feet quite well and they can use them to help climb. They got little nails on the end. It helps them um, when they're digging their burrows. Like they can cling on to, you know, the bark of trees and the and rocks and things like that too. So they have little kind of um, um yeah, they're 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 quite good at climbing actually, using their bill and their their legs to get up. Now when you you say also mother nature or instinctively the weirdest thing about everything is is when they are adults themselves speaking of the babies they almost come back to almost the exact same burrow or the location and that um quite humbly meaning this island of koi yes that's correct they they have high site fidelity which means when they leave and they they fledge from a, a nest site nest at location um they are drawn back to that location um when they're adults so they'll come back to that colony area uh, once they it, um, once they're ready to breed, um, which is why um, um, the there's some translocation work happening here on island, um, and basically the young are taken before they imprint on their site um, when they're their um, their nest site, and they are being put into an area that is predator proof at up at Nohoku, and um, they. Uh, it's in the hopes to um, build another colony. So those birds will imprint on that site as their breeding colony and they come back there when they're ready to breed. So you have a database when you mentioned that some of these birds were not really injured per se, but they were just fallen because of the light, light and disorientation. Mm -hmm. So when it's deemed that they're healthy enough to release, as you, you say, you then tag them, you say, and then how often I mean, do you have that database like, oh, this guy was here three years ago, seven years ago, this guy yeah, or so gal, all, I should say. Uh, oh, nearly all in the whole um, time period of this program uh, that have been banded. So uh, each bird gets a, an individual uh, band, uh, a metal band that will be on it for life. Uh, it is inscribed with unique numbers to that bird. Uh, and it, there is a database, there's a federal database that um, takes these numbers and keeps them in a... Um, of all the people that do banding, bird banding, um, but we also have our own database. And actually last year we did have a recapture from a previous fledging season. So we had a downed um, subadult 
that was unfortunately dead when it was found, but it was from the 20, 2006, uh, 16 season. Um, it was banded as a fledgling at that time. So, you know, we, we chatted and I really love and enjoy it. We learned so much from you, Tracy Anderson. But when they're out in the open ocean in the Arctic or Pacific Northwest or wherever, it's like cold, 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 cold. And we sometimes uh, kind of compare it to a penguin probably more so because it's black and white kind of looks like a little mini tuxedo yeah but let us remind us how long did the how how long can these birds hold their breath and how technically deep do they go to go get their food well the new Wilshire water has been um uh seen or uh, documented to dive up to 150 feet i'm not too sure i can't remember the breath holding that but it's like a minute or so at least uh to get down there uh grab its prey and up again so 150 feet they're they're pretty deep divers for um in, in the bird world yeah and that's one of the reasons uh that you repeat again and again to the local public all of whom want to help uh, many of whom are visitors that learn from the hotel or learn from commercials that they hear that it's important to turn the bird over, don't give them water, turn the bird over meaning not flip them, mm -hmm. but to report it to you folks, bring it to the nearest fire station because little things that we don't know, like we got suntan, uh, I don't wanna say lotion, but sunscreen yeah. mm -hmm. that can penetrate within the body, just a small spot. Mm -hmm. And that would, that would consequently be that area that the water or the, uh, hypothermia or what have you would mm -hmm. be kicking in yes we we really want to check them over and make certain that they're what we call them waterproof uh, so those outer feathers they're th their main defense against um, since they have no place to set down they go on the water or they're flying out on the ocean um, if their if their outer feathers are permeable to water that is a big problem because the water will seep through into the down underneath and a lot of us know what down ha what happens to down when it gets wet it gets wet and soggy and cold those birds will um, then succumb to hypothermia uh, they'll stop feeding because they don't want to dive to get their food um, and uh, so hypothermia and or starvation and so we really do want to check them over make certain that their feathers are in good condition um, and otherwise you know we have ways of testing that here um, and we have pools that we put them in make certain that they have that um, buoyancy that waterproofness um, that and and in the odd occasion I mean we don't have to do it to too many of them but we may have to wash them so if they get road, road oils on them or something like that um, they're unable to remove that themselves so we need to give them a wash and we follow um, oil spill protocols for that kind of thing so we'll give them a good wash get their water their feathers um, clean again and then they can um, put them all back into order and be waterproof do okay let's just see i'm just gonna give you a title like an ornithologist or a scientist or what have you but do you believe in global warming <laughs> or climate oh, change one. yes i do i i um, believe that it is uh human caused climate change yes because I, I would just like to let the viewing audience know we've been blessed to uh, talk about this incredible subject about native birds here mm -hmm. uh, that's been here hundreds of thousands of years ago. But when we chatted with you several times, I remember, you know, there's a, a tropical storm or a little mini hurricane that mm -hmm. the winds are blowing different. It's coming from a weird direction. I mean, it's like the perfect storm and other types of migratory birds that never really pass through the Hawaiian Islands get blown off chart. And then the next thing you know, they're one of the birds that are discovered on Kauai. Is that an accurate way to say how these uh, these uh, climates changing and pushing it, things? Yeah, to? and it can it can change where things migrate or how they migrate, um, different wind patterns, that sort of thing. Um, you know, fallout that the odd bird year to year that happens on Kauai that is not supposed to be here from other places that has been happening for quite a while because you will get these freak storms when they're they're. Um, they're migrating and things, but what it appears to be is that the storms are um, increasing intensity um, and uh, in frequency, um, and it, it just may happen more and more. Well, I guess, you know, when we really think about it, that's probably things that happened thousands and thousands of years ago, and this is maybe how a lot of the native birds just happen to come to the Hawaiian Islands, and then consequently, because they might have been blown off chart, they, this is the only place that they, do, they were home. So when they would come back, then obviously, they beeline it and come well, to the Garden Island of Kauai. Some of the species actually, um, so the new, the shearwaters and petrels, they they actually s search out um, island 
uh, archipelagos and things like that, like Hawaii, because of how they nest as well. So what happens is they nest in holes in the ground. It makes them very vulnerable to uh, mammalian predators. Um, and on these far-flung islands, there used to be no um, uh, m mammals, uh, mammalian predators. So um, they populated these these islands um, and uh, did very well until we started introducing those species and those predators here. So that's, um, you know, that's another way that they, they moved around. But we are losing some of the, the outer islands to uh, sea level rise, um, more frequent storms. So species like other burrow nesting species like bone-in petrels, we don't have them here on, on Kauai, um, but they, their burrows are getting flooded more frequently. So they lose, lose their, uh, their chicks and their eggs and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's a big problem. So for those people, which are probably very few, or for the visitors, how blessed are we that we don't have mongoose on Kauai? Very, very blessed. They are a, an amazing little animal in their own right, um, in their native habitat. Um, but they are incredible predators and they are, um, will take prey many times their size sometimes. And the fact that we don't have them here is, is very good. Yeah. They're like, sadly, like the modern day weasel or mm -hmm. Tasmanian yeah. devil. They might not necessarily eat something, but they'll just wipe everything out. Well, they they do. And because they're quick, they have a high metabolism. They, they have to eat quite frequently as well. So and they're they're really good little predators. And so we're really good. It's really good that we don't have them here. Well, Tracy Anderson, and if you just joined us, we are here with Tracy Anderson. What is your official title? I'm the program coordinator for the Save Our Share Waters program. So there's not a lot of people that know what you know, not, I mean, humbly speaking. Uh, th I mean, there's other people that do a lot more research on, on the, um, and other programs that do research on the birds up in the mountains, on their, their breeding sites, on the numbers, the population. Um, I, I specialize in, in the birds once they're, they're the, the ha husbandry side of things. Um, so the handling, the getting them out in good condition, uh, that sort of thing, yeah. Well, and basically I was meaning like, say for example, if there's none on Oahu, maybe there's a few on the Big Island, smaller colonies. If it was prevalent all over or the mainland or every place else, people would probably want to try to scoop you up for all the information you know to, to care for that. As always, Tracy Anderson, thank you for joining us on Vala'o, but leave the viewing audience one key fact that most of us don't know that you want to share with the people in regards to the Nuo Shea Waters here on our Garden Island of Kauai. I'm trying to remember what ones I haven't given you before. Um, I think we've talked about the diving before, uh, the fact that they don't ever drink fresh water, they don't ever need to drink fresh water, they have glands in their in their heads there um, that filter their blood and, and the excess salt in their blood is is excreted that way, so they don't ever have to drink fresh water. Thank you, Tracy. And for further information about the Nuo Shear Waters here on our Garden Island of Kauai, please call the Kauai Humane Society. Again, please call the Kauai Humane Society. We're going to have to take a short break, but when we come back, we'll tell you about a world premiere, about a movie that we get to see right here on our beautiful Garden Island of Kauai this coming Saturday evening. Don't go away, gang. Vala'au and the Storybook Theater. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Vanessa Carano. I'm a Sheldon Leasing Rep with King Auto Center. We have an extensive inventory of new and used vehicles from Hanas and Rams to Ford F-150s and Toyota Tacomas. Let me help you find the vehicle that best suits your family and your needs. Call me at 245-4788 and ask for Vanessa Carano. Again, that's 245-4788, Vanessa Carano. Hope to see you soon. Healthier is quality care close to home. Healthier is state-of-the-art facilities and the largest and best team of doctors on Kauai. It's specialty care and caring in a special way. Healthier is Kauai's only comprehensive bone and joint center with expertise in joint replacement, hands, feet, ankles, and sports medicine. Wilcox Health, creating a healthier Hawaii. Captain Andy's sailing. Nobody has more fun.
Captain Andy, the ultimate sailing adventure. Welcome back, Koi. We have a special world premiere of a beautiful movie that was filmed and edited by our very dear friend with Bamboo Moon Production, Dr. Robert Zelkowski. Dr. Robert Zelkowski, along with our very dear friend, Mark Jeffers, is from the Storybook Theater. He'll to tell us a little bit about a world premiere is none other than our very dear friend, of course, with the Storybook Theater, Mark Jeffers. Mark, tell us what we can expect this coming Saturday on the outskirts of beautiful downtown Hanapepe. Yeah, that's not a surprise. We occasionally do things that are pretty exciting down in Hanapepe. So the Storybook Theater, uh, for the viewing audience, everybody knows Russell the Rooster, you know, over 20 years. Uh, Storybook Theater, what a story in itself. Uh, I guess an old, rustic, abandoned building. And uh, bottom line is you can't tear that stuff down. You gotta, well, you gotta <laughs> restore it uh, in the old-fashioned way, old school way. People thought we were a little Lolo when we took over this property. It's a Hawaiian land and it's an old Chinese restaurant. And... Um, uh, but the building itself, we needed something that would catch people's attention. So I started to talk around town to some of the old timers and say, hey, what's this town famous for? What's going on here? Who are, this, who are the great heroes and sheroes of this place? And Sparky's name kept coming up, kept coming up. Uh, Lefty Ozaki and Mr. Nakashima and Mr. Mitball and all these people that were in that generation, that Nisei generation that all had nicknames from AJA Baseball. And they told me Sparky was the man. So we talked to the family, and they said, yes, use Sparky's uh, legacy to help to develop the program and the project. And then, of course, eventually we opened the garden, and there's the bronze statue of Spark Matsunaka. So now when you say Sparky was the man, for the benefit of uh, many of whom are not just necessarily visitors, but those have called Kauai their home uh, most recent times, five years, 10 years, 15 years ago, when you talk about somebody like Sparky, uh, that was quite a while back, but why was he, or who is he as a man? Well, Nisei means a second generation Japanese family. He's a Japanese American. He was an American citizen, but he was born in the time of the Great Depression. And as he grew up, of course, the United States was called into war, World War II. And he was, as a Japanese man, he had to make decisions about what was going to happen because, of course, uh, going into war with the Japanese uh, meant that he had to uh, join the American army. So um, after some exciting times as a youth, including headed off to college, which was really rare in those days, especially coming from a poor family, uh, he joined the American army and was shipped to uh, do basic training, I believe, in Minnesota. And then his unit, the 100th Battalion, was sent to uh, northern Italy. And they became famous. They were the go for broke battalion and they are the most decorated unit in the American army in World War II in the European theater. So he got out and um, he was given the task of, of giving the famous 800 speeches for um, uh, reparations for having put the Japanese families into internment camps. So he was pr uh, primary mover and shaker for, for that whole initiative in the American um, right after World War II. And he became a politician and be reflecting back is it's like if you don't know your history then you don't have a history and i'm encouraging people to come and see this this documentary this docudrama about sparky because of that because knowing your history is really important and um so he became a, a politician uh, during the time of statehood and you know that whole japanese contingency was very strong and very moving towards proving their loyalty and helping the Hawaiian become a state in the United States. And then he went into the um, American Congress uh, as a congressperson in the early 70s and spent almost 18 years as a United States congressman and senator. And then he died in office in uh, 1990. And he was a very famous person because he was um, very strategic in his politics. He made sure he had everybody on board before he presented uh, legislation for voting. But he, he stuck with it. Like, for example, the United States Institute of Peace. Um, it took him 20-something years to bring that le legislation to fruition. But he had, what, you know, what? 80 or 90 co-signers of the bill when he brought it to the Senate. And the United States Institute of Peace is a real feather in his cap, but a feather in our cap as, a, as an initiative that really helps people to understand that we need peace in the world now. His idea was world peace in our lifetime, and we can do it. He had great ideas for making world peace happen. I want the children in Hanapepe and the children of Kauai to understand this person as a hero, 
because, um, you know, it's more important to look at people like Sparky who've done things that have benefited, you know, our not only our state, but the whole world as important people, heroes that they can emulate because they came from here. You know what I'm saying? You can you can pick a hero that came from Washington, D.C. or Europe or something, but to pick a hero from this place, that's what impressed me about Spark. And his family uh, are very good people, and they're very um, down-home people and down-to-earth people. This film that was edited by uh, Robert Zalkowski, Bamboo Moon Video, um, really tells an amazing story because it's told by a storyteller. We have a professional storyteller, Alton Takayama Chun, who wrote a play about Spark. And how do you write a play about somebody? Do you become that person or how do you do it? And so what Alton did was he, came, he became Sparky's friend, an imaginary uh, character, a fictional character that grew up with Spark and went to war with Spark and then became the, a security guard at the Capitol and knew Spark because Spark was a, a work late kind of guy. Now, we've asked a friend of his to say a few words about the light sender. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Kenny Hiro Hiroshi. Hi. Uh, they won't ask me to say a few words about my friend, uh, Spock Matsunaga. You know, if Spocky was here right now, he'd be laughing his head off because he know I don't like talking in public. I mean, he was the outgoing guy. He was the guy who, you see a family with kids, you, you go over there and, and tell them stories from Hawaii. And Hiro was the person in the film, in the film that we created, that tells the story of Sparky Matsunaga. But then he suddenly transforms and becomes Sparky himself and says some of Spark's poetry and uh, some of his tough times in his life, the hard times in his life. If we want peace, we must educate our people to want peace. We must replace attitudes favorable toward war with attitudes that are opposed to war. Teachers should let generals fall to the background and perhaps replace them with leaders of social change and bring them to the foreground. We must show our young people that there are other types of bravery than that which is shown on the battlefield. So it's a very interesting play on, um, it's like watching a stage play, a storyteller and a, and a, and a character, a real life character in history. And we were able to get some great historic footage. We did a lot of research, went to the uh, university archives and the, um, and the, the Daniel K. Inoy, uh media archives and we found some videotape of Spark so people will actually uh, hear his voice. To one additional committee, to, uh, subcommittee to which uh, I was not assigned, but I've been assigned to four different subcommittees. Um, the what first, are they? Uh, the uh, principal one of which is the uh, Foreign Agricultural Operations uh, Subcommittee headed by uh, Congressman Polk of uh, Texas. And this is the committee uh, which uh, has been looking into he's a great speaker you know that kind of um you know generation where they all people japanese people chinese people filipino people they learned how to speak correctly uh, the english language in order to be sure that people would listen to them and understand you know what i'm saying in other words they rose to that uh challenge of of good language well i, I think at that point in time you also had to um you had to prove yourself to show them that not only you could speak proper grammar, if you will, but you are educated in the sense that you could deliver what you're trying to speak eloquently. When they're listening, they finally listen to you. Yes. Then they're saying, hey, this, this cat knows what he's talking about. Right, right. And, and we have examples of that. I don't know. You, you probably met Patsy Mink. And, um, you know, and Spark, of course, many of the people that we've interviewed and talked with actually knew Spark and talked with Spark. The people of Hanapepe sometimes were disappointed because they didn't get enough of Spark. You know, he lived in Washington, D.C., and when he came back, he was in the political campaigning mode a lot of the time. Uh, this um, videotape, though, we had to make choices on where to show it and, and how to present it to the public. So this showing is a world premiere and it's on uh, October 5th, which is this coming Saturday. And it's at the Hanapepe United Church of Christ, which is a stone's throw from where Spark grew up.
there close by the river in Hanapepe, right across from the Hanapepe Library. We're going to open up the doors at 5.30 and we have poo-poos and desserts from area restaurants. So people will be able to sample good um, cuisine from the area restaurants. And then we have two guest speakers, um, uh, Brian Hallett, who's a professor of peace studies at the Matsunaga Institute of Peace at U University of Hawaii, and Stephanie Castillo, who's a, a documentary filmmaker. She's going to talk about the challenges of making documentary films. And then we have some of our board members. I'm hoping to tickle uh, Dr. Zalkowski, see if I can get him to talk about what it's like to spend, I don't know, 100 hours editing a film, you know. Minimum. <laughs> you know, what a world, right? And then, then we have uh, Taiko Kawai. So we're going to have some excitement. We're going to recognize people in the audience because we do have some great people coming. And we want everybody to come. If, if the $25 ticket admission price scares you a little bit, please just come and ask for a ticket and make a donation at the door. We want you to come and to see the film. It's, it's an important film. Uh, I remember listening to Roselle Bailey tell me one time, she says, Mark, um, history is so important because if you don't know your history, then you don't have a history. And that's one of the reasons why young people go a little bit crazy or why we walk around a little bit in a daze is that we're not deeply rooted, you know, in our history, our historical past. And the more we look back at that, the more we can be solid and confident in who we are. Now, when you say it's the world premiere, are you saying that this is going to be the first time that human eyes actually have seen this film? <laughs> I like how you said that. Um, yes. We've never shown it. We never put it on our TV show. We've never showed it at Storybook Theater. We've never shown it. So this is the very first time it's a world premiere. So my question is, um, honestly, because uh, I can anticipate a nice inquisitive crowd, you know, Kupuna or perhaps the children of those that grew up with Sparky, their children that knew Spark. Certainly. I, I would imagine that I would hope that people would like to pass this info down, as you mentioned, to history. So hopefully youngsters, you know, maybe teenagers or, you know, the millennials, if they really want to know what, 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 what happened in, uh, back then, uh, Kauai's biggest little town, which was probably <laughs> like 20 times smaller than what it is now. Well, the Hanapepe competed with Lihui to be the capital of this island. I don't know if you knew that story, but, you know, Lihui won out because they finished their harbor first. But Hanapepe is a, was not a plantation town. And so it was rough and ready, and it was a port town. So during the war days and uh, during the sugar plantation days, the harbor, there was a lot of influx of people, and it was a rough and ready place. That's why a lot of merchants, you know, created the town of Hanapepe. Um, I believe that the footage that we have of our storyteller is very nicely woven together with historical photos from the plantation days, and from the war days, we were able to get some very nice war, I say nice war photos, from the university archives and his political career. So people who come that are in Sparks' generation or just slightly younger, my generation, um, will recognize those photos of Hana Pepe and, um, you know, uh, World War II and the poli politics. And the children will enjoy the storyteller aspect and how our storyteller weaves together that fictional character and the real character together. So there's something there for everybody, I guess. And it's not a long movie. It's 45 minutes long. So we'll have some talk stories, some good food, and a very nice film. And, and, and you know, United Church of Christ there in Hanapipi is a very, very comfortable place. And there's a lot of parking. And uh, it's a Saturday evening. The doors open at 530 and we'll be we'll be Paohana by eight o'clock or so. Well, so people go home and get their rest. Well, we look forward to meeting uh, Hiro Hiroshi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm just going to say a couple of things. You know, when you talk about Sparky going uh, side by side with the Caucasian of, we, as you mentioned, uh, the Haole. Yeah. Um, and wondering why are they making four times more than us? This was way before the word discrimination ever came into the Webster's Dictionary vocabulary. But mm -hmm. another interesting thing that you say, you mentioned uh, State uh, House of Representative then, uh, Patsy Mink, the uh, vibrant and spunky, not sparky, but spunky Patsy Mink. Was it was very great. interesting because she ran against Sparky for oh. the United States Senate, if you may remember. He won about 70% of the votes, uh, I believe. But it's interesting because in her pathway following the wisdom of then Senator Spark Matsunaga, Remember, upon his passing, she championed the uh, equal rights rights with women. That's right. Being able to participate right. in 
in all sports. That's another, another incredible story. Yes. Uh, because of Sparky, that the women could be in women's soccer, or women's basketball, women's softball. Right. And she also equally fought to get equal pay. So this is a great, great story. And I, I'm hoping that it's a sellout. Yeah. I'll do my best to be there. But more Thank importantly, you. I can see this documentary at the Waimea Theater. I could see it at the Princeville. KCC Performing Arts Center. Uh, the, the Church of the Pacific up at Princeville because this is something that needs to be shown and what an honor that it's the, uh, the world premiere. And I hope a lot of tourists that seek much more than the sun and surf that really want to dig into the history because a lot of tourists, they actually do participate in things about about history and they want to do something different. That's right. In fact, our board of directors said that, no, no, we've got to do the premiere in Hanapepe. Absolutely. This is Sparky's place. This is Sparky's town. We've got to do it here. And then and then you're right. We'll try to do a little lay of showings around the island and make sure that everyone sees it. Now, we will have the DVD available for $20 at the at the um, premiere so people can take it home with them and watch it at their leisure as well. Well, that's very, very cool. I want to reach out to, uh, you had mentioned uh, Bamboo uh, Moon Productions, yeah. Dr. Rob Zelkowski. He, again, is one of the many unsung heroes that are behind the camera, but want to thank him. And thank you for allowing the Vala Al audience to yet again be education uh, uh, educated because I know that you're a historian and you're a storyteller, and what better way to keep the mana'o going by not only being able to uh, portray history, but certainly to be able to tell it and tell it so articulately. I'm so very, very surprised at uh, how much you studied into Sparky or Spark Matsunaga because what a what a wonderful man, and you put it best, you know, he served the nation, and when he came here, maybe not as much time to reflect in the Hanabata days because when you're on the campaign trail, you bop in and you bop out, yeah. and uh, uh, <laughs> you, at least you get to talk story and go, hopefully they had a I don't know, a Hamura assignment, or they went to Wong's restaurant or oh, something, yeah, and a yeah, Lily Koi chiffon yeah. pie or something like that. But mahalo nui lo, and uh, take this opportunity once again to share your aloha and remind us of the time, uh, okay. the ticket donations and, and what have you, this coming Saturday. Yeah, it's uh, coming Saturday, October 5th, Hanapepe United Church of Christ. It's right across from the fire station, right across from the Hanapepe Library. Lots of parking. Doors will open up at 5.30. Please come early. Um, we, we know it's going to be a, a nice crowd. We They'll have poo-poos from the local restaurants in Hanapepe and uh, desserts. And then we have some good speakers, uh, Brian Hallett and Stephanie Castillo and, and some Taiko Kawai. And then and watching the film will be great fun. And uh, we want to welcome everybody. If you can't afford that $25 ticket price, come anyway. And uh, we'll make sure that just with your small donation, you can get inside and see the film. So please come and, and enjoy it. Thank you once again to Mark Jeffers with the Storybook Theater, Dr. Robert Zelkowski. Thank you for editing. Don't forget the world premiere of the life of Sparky Matsunaga. Remember, Spark Matsunaga was a resident here of Hanapepe, came to go on local routes, local beginnings, uh, four, four, uh, four, four, uh, the 442nd Infantry, war hero, and of course, turned to be a House representative and of course, a United States Senator. The story of Sparky Matsunaga, Hanapepe, this coming Saturday, at beginning at, I believe, beginning at 530 Give me a call, 635-8800, 635-880, and we'll see you there. Don't go away, gang. Vala Al, we'll be right back. Vala. Spark Matsunaga was a dedicated family man, decorated war veteran, peace advocate, and politician. Join us for the very first screening of the Storybook Theater documentary, Spark Matsunaga, Poet for Peace, Saturday, October 5th, 5.30 p.m. at the Hanapepe United Church of Christ. Tickets 335-012 or at eventbrite.com. See you at the movie. Aloha, I'm Barbara Bennett, owner and publisher of the Islands Monthly Community Magazine for Kauai. Available at newsstands, mailed to you by request or at the Honolulu and Lahui airports. I invite you to join our local residents and read our stories. All local, all community, all Kauai. Read For Kauai Magazine on our website, forkauaionline.com. With more feature stories, videos, daily calendar, and local news that will excite and interest you. Visit us daily, weekly on the web, and monthly in print. Mahalo and aloha. Aloha Kauai, my name is Joy Kagawa. I'm a sales representative at King Auto Center. Please visit us here 
Uh, we'd love to show you our new cars, like this new Passport that just came back into the Honda line of cars. Please come in for a no-pressure buying experience at King Auto Center. I'll show you this brand new Passport. Um, come and see Joy Kagawa, King Auto Center. Please ask for me and see what the King can do for you. Thank you, Kawaii. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Valaao. As always, we'd like to sincerely thank each and every one of you for watching Valaao and making us a possible week in and week out. We are on Spectrum Cable 128. Don't forget now, just turn it on. Bing, 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 bing. Channel 128 every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, 7 a.m., 12 noon, 4 p.m., 7 p.m., 12 midnight. Spectrum, and of course, whenever we get online, we'll be able to let you folks know because we are streaming on YouTube and that, of course, Valaao Kauai. Now, if you want to check out any of the episodes, W-A- L-A-A-U, Valaau Kauai, K-A-U-A-I, Valaau Kauai. You can check out much of the many, many episodes only on YouTube and Valaau. This weekend, we got a pretty cool concert. Now, everybody knows we have the life of Sparky Matsunaga. That's going to be presented by our very dear friends there at the Storybook Theater. That's going to be happening at the Hanapepe Church of Christ. I believe that's the church right across the fire department by Nokooi Plants and what have you. We'll see you there. But we also have the divas from Maui. That's right, the divas from Maui. Who are the divas from Maui? Raya Tea Helm, Molokai. Uh, we got Napua Greg, Kumuhula Napua Greg. And of course, we have Amy Hanai Ali'i. They're going to be performing at the War Memorial Convention Hall. So, you guys want to go check out? We got to go check out the divas or the titas from the island of Maui. Again, that is Raya Tea Helm. Uh, we got Amy Hanai Ali'i and Kumuhula Napua Greg. That's going to be happening 7 30 this coming Saturday there at the War Memorial Convention Hall. This coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, this is our second annual Kauai Peace and Yoga Festival. The Peace and Yoga Festival is put together by my very, very dear friend, the president of the organization, Anya Love, along with her very dear friends. You can check them out at www.alohafestivals. Check it out. It's going to be happening at Lidgate Park this coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. There are workshops. There are yoga classes. There is a lot of joy. There's a lot of fun. There's a lot of art. There's a lot of music. There's a lot of craft. There's a lot of fellowship. For further information, you can call Anya at 635-6050. 6356050 of course you can log on to www.alohafest.com in addition to the aloha yoga and peace festival of course this coming friday our very dear friend from mahilona hospital uh, josie pablo reminds all of us that october is breast cancer awareness month where you pink we're going to do the annual walk at keala hele makalai right at the kapa'a area so a good place to park is probably on the back side by the swimming pool and the library. You're gonna have an opportunity along with the residents of Mahilona to walk the short walk along the path. And that's gonna be this coming Friday. That is October 4th. And that's gonna be happening at Kealahele Makalai, downtown Kapa'a. And we're gonna do a nice little walk. You're recommended to wear your piece, uh, your pink. And of course, this will be in demonstration and in honor and in thoughts of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And please remember, even the men, one out of a thousand can get hit with breast cancer. It is time for us to hele on. As always, let's all continue to take care of our families, our friends, the neighbors, the Malahini and the Aina. And we'll check you guys out next week. Only stay safe. We'll see you somewhere on Kauai. On Valaa. 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 Valaa.